Welcome to the October 26, 2017 business meeting, and we're going to start with a roll call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, of course, we have Mr. Chris Story here this morning, who is representing the Office of County Council, and Mary Rathke serving as your clerk to the board this morning. I see we have a couple of commissioners who are not here this morning. I'll go ahead and do the roll call for those who are. Uh, Commissioner Hungerston? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Chair Bernard? Here. And I know that Commissioner Savas is as a JPAC, Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation in Portland. And I don't know if you've driven to Portland lately. Or Traffic's from. been pretty bad. So <laughs> uh, anyway, he should be here shortly, and I'm not sure about Martha. So please join me in a Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, first up, we have a presentation. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have an opportunity to recognize our Water Environment Services Department. Uh, they're receiving a certification as a Clackamas County leader in sustainability. And I want to invite uh, Evan Polk from our Office of Sustainability up to the dais to present this. Welcome. Thanks. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Evan Polk, and I'm the Supervisor for the Resource Conservation and Solid Waste Program in DTD. As you may be aware, we administer a program that certifies and recognizes businesses for adopting uh, more sustainable practices called Leaders in Sustainability. And it is my pleasure this morning to introduce Kelly Stewart, a senior analyst in our program, and Shannon Bays, the Resource Recovery Supervisor for Water Environment Services, to tell you about Wes's recent accomplishment in joining the ranks of certified workplaces. So, Kelly, Shannon. Welcome, good morning. Thank you, good morning. Good morning, thank you for having us. Um, my name is Kelly Stewart, and just a little bit more about the Leaders in Sustainability Certification Program. It's an opportunity to recognize the achievements of businesses in reducing waste, uh, conserving resources, promoting a healthy workplace, and helping to build both a vibrant community and a thriving Clackamas County. So we were excited when Wes came to us in December of 2016, just last year, with the interest to become the first county department um, to get certified showing an additional county support and commitment to sustainability. Uh, we were impressed by their enthusiasm. After just a few short uh, process meetings, they just ran with it. Um, Wes already had a commitment to sustainability and had many of the practices from the checklist completed, but the Leaders in Sustainability program and the checklist um, helped bring all those practices together cohesively and identify just a few other opportunities. Um, overall, they completed 44 practices to become silver certified and are already working towards a higher level of certification, being just nine practices away from gold certification. So just a few of the items that I was most impressed with um, were they, uh, with leadership's approval, they started a green team and then expanded that team to include representatives from multiple areas um, of their business, including their treatment facilities and other locations and office. They created a green team brochure to introduce new employees um, to what they were doing in terms of sustainability. And just the conversations um, that they had around the checklist and the practices on the checklist, the depth and detail was really impressive. Um, you know, the inventorying that they did for this certification and those conversations are really what I think is, you know, extremely valuable about this program. Um, the other thing is that they marked all the storm drains at all of their facilities, including a marker that I was impressed with that notes that it drains to the facility. So obviously they're treating the water and it drained right there to that facility. So congratulations, West, for an outstanding job. Thank you so much. Um, I am very proud to accept this um, for Clackamas County West, and I just really, we, West is in a unique position because we have so many staff people that are, that came to West because of their passion for protecting the environment, 
And this award really opens up an opportunity for us to bring some of the leaders within our department together. And I was impressed with their passion and their desire not just to check a box, but to really find a way to make this something that we were gonna be able to sustain over time. And I really enjoyed working with um, resource conservation and solid waste. And I hope that we are just the first of many departments that are gonna go through this process. We have such alignment and, and really a passion for the, all of the county and the resources that we have in protecting them that um, I'm hoping that this is just the first presentation that you'll see of many. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments? With that, I believe we're gonna take a photo. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Push back as far as possible, please, so take it down to the overhead lighting. <laughs> oh, Evan, you can take it up. That's fine, I'll just hold it. <laughs> okay, ready? We're going to take a couple. Can we get one with <laughs> Okay, let's see that. Okay, ready? On the count of three, one, two, three. One more, one, two, three. Like that? <laughs> we need to start collecting. You know, Ben Boswell, member of AOC, had a book of Benisms. Oh, yeah. But, you know, so we need to start collecting stuff like that. What I mean by Some of mine are not, are, are would be, um, it's okay. They're not family rated. <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to move on to citizen communication. I dropped one of these on the floor. It might be out of order, but, uh, oh, I think this is uh, Raymond, Ramana, and uh, Al. Ramona. Ramona. Oh. Ramona and Al. Dave Ramona, he's an actor. <laughs> like He's been Raymond for 51 years. <laughs> Yeah, and I actually was, was talking a little bit about you earlier today. I heard that uh, the so-called hemp farm next door might be oh, yeah. marijuana. Uh, we, have, uh, we have the report right here for you. I think it's yeah. a report that we ought to turn over to our sheriff's department. And uh, we, I call the, uh, I call the sheriff's department, I call the Department of uh, drug, drug Enforcement. And uh, she said she talked to her... Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, I'd be. yeah. Introduce supervisor. yourself. Yeah, yeah. to her supervisor, and uh, she hasn't gotten back to me yet. Mm. Can you state your name for the record? Sure. Okay, I'm Ramona Knotts. Do you want the address? Well, whoever's going to go first, just the name's fine. You're going first. Oh, I'm going first. I'm Al Knotts. Uh, I live at 30200 South Chandel Road, Molella, 97038. Go ahead. Are we ready? We're ready. Okay. Uh, uh, hemp needs to be regulated for the county to protect the county from people who have no regard for the uh, for the safety of our children and the people of Clackamas County. All they care about is the buck, the money. That's all they care about. They don't care about the security 
and the uh, respectability of the people who live around them. Uh, hemp can be grown with no fencing. It can be grown next to schools. As noted, there's a 35 acre hemp grow, hemp, let's say not hemp, let's say marijuana grow, out in Boring, Oregon, that is no fencing, no nothing, right off a school yard, right, right next to the school yard. Across the street. Across the street, street yeah. from a school yard. Now, let's say uh, in Canby, they have uh, agricultural area where school kids walk back and forth to school. They can grow it right there, where, where kids grow right, right back and forth to school. The hemp grow next to us are five to ten foot high, buds this long, 2,000 of them, and it's high in THC. The qualifications for hemp is 0 0.03 THC. It is twice the amount of THC. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are in touch with the State Agriculture Department, but the State Agriculture Bar Department says, well, we knew about this 20 days ago. I says, did you inform the Clackamas County Sheriff's Department or the Clackamas County that, uh, that we have an illegal marijuana grow next to my neighbor that's eight foot off of his, his uh, front yard? And... Uh, one of our neighbors has their uh, grandkids out there uh, playing and stuff, and it's it's an illegal marijuana grow, is what it is, period. And the state uh, state says, well, we're working with the uh, grower to figure out what what uh, what we can do about uh, destroying the crop right now, you know. And also, I said, I says, well. I says, this neighbor has, has grown uh, illegal marijuana grow in, the, uh, in their shop, and, uh, and they got busted for it a year ago, and then, then you turn around and give them a, a marijuana license? No, to, uh, no, it was a, a hemp, hemp permit. Uh, a hemp permit mm -hmm. to grow hemp, and it turns out to be marijuana. I says, uh, uh, are you going to give them a license next year? Oh, it was an incidental thing. So yes, we're going. Yeah, we'll give them a marijuana, a uh, uh, hemp. hemp license next year. So what I'm looking forward uh, for is the county to get some regulations on this thing, to make sure that it is not accessible to to uh, communities and people that you know their children and stuff. That's what I want the county to do. Okay. You're up. <laughs> okay. Um, in our meeting with Commissioner Jim Bernard and Paul Savas, this is a, a couple months back, when looking at the pictures, Jim said, this looks just like marijuana. And now we know it tests to be marijuana. It is not hemp. It is double the THC of hemp. This was an intentional grow site, not accidental. Um, early summer, our neighbor Greg tilled up in front of his house, beside his house, behind his house, all the acreage, tilled it up. He had it tilled because he's a, a lazy guy. He had it tilled up, and we were wondering, what are they going to plant? What are they going to plant out there? Well, then in July... Greg took a vacation, and when he returned from vacation, the whole fields were planted with little pot plants, cannabis, whatever you want to call it, the whole fields. So when Greg returned from vacation, he was waving, calling for my attention over this little wire fence that runs down the um, easement and he's yelling at me. We can be friends again. We got our act together. And then he yelled really loud and waved really high and screamed, marijuana. This was an intentional grow. 
He knew what he was planting. He knew what he had ordered for the plants. And now it turns out to be twice the THC that a hemp plant could be legally. It is marijuana. He is growing it out in the open on an EFU zoning. And we need to have something done legally against the problem that he's creating, the problem that others are creating up and down Barnard's Road. You can see his hemp grow, which is now marijuana. You can see it from Barnard's Road. The plants, huge. They're purple, they're green, they're purple, they're green, they're black, they're brown. He has many varieties out there. They're budded like crazy. Put a sign up, free marijuana. Point yeah, that that's way. what she said. <laughs> exactly what she said. Marijuana, say <laughs> pizza. May, 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 may I add something? Uh, if, if when they plant this, they don't know what it is until 28 days before harvest, then what really is it? Yeah. And, and the county should regulate it because they don't know what it is. So I'm going to be honest with you. There is no way we're going to be regulating hemp. I, I will work on talking to the sheriff. I'm going to golf on Friday with somebody from the agriculture department in the legislature. That's all we can do. We cannot send people into the fields, cut a crop, take it to the lab, We'd be doing this. No, the lab already did I'm, that. I'm not. Oh, no, no, you're I'm just not. one of how many? How, one of how many around the county? You know, it, it cannot be our responsibility. The, the legislature made it a crop. Yes, they Against did. the wishes of, I'm sure, the voters. But, uh, but they made a crop <coughs> of hemp right to farm. Right. They did not make a crop of illegal marijuana. They made, a, uh, they made marijuana a crop. If you file for an OLCC right. permit, right. and they did not. Because so we called you, OLCC. So you're saying he does not have an OLCC permit to no, grow marijuana. That is what you're telling us. Permit no, to grow hemp. Exactly. Okay. Yep, so he the, the, filed for a permit to grow hemp, right. and it is placed on his gate. It is not hemp that he's growing. Now, I've, I've talked to people from the uh, state and uh, the state agriculture department and, and other people, and they said, go to your county. That's, yeah, what, they, sure. that's what they tell me. Right. I, I'm, I'm honest with you. Yeah. Well, I, I believe it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're yeah. trying to put it on somebody's back. Oh, you bet. It, Frankly, it should be on their back. Well, yeah, they it should to be. Make it exactly. A crop. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to say that, um, indeed, I met with these folks, and um, yeah, hemp, hemp, is, hemp is indeed exempted, but it's on the premise that it's got a certain THC maximum, mm -hmm. and obviously it sounds like that is a, a higher potency of THC co content, and also that it's, uh, as I'm learning, it is something that is desirable, not for personal consumption so much as for some of the um, concentrates. Um, so. It's, uh, that's where um, it's, there's a market for it. Uh, we were at the Association of Oregon Counties conference here a couple months ago and we had the um, person from the OLCC was in charge of marijuana. Of course, she fielded a lot of questions, one of which was from me. And that is, you know, we've been led to believe that the state was gonna regulate mm -hmm. marijuana with a seed to sale concept, which in which they would make sure, I thought, that they wouldn't allow or issue any more permits than what the market demanded as mm -hmm. a means to control the market to make sure that there would not be a continued export. And people are arguing now that maybe what we're exporting out of our state, which is, by the way, against federal law, maybe somewhere between 60 to 80 percent. Some say it's higher than that. But it regardless, it doesn't matter if we know that. And they're still issuing licenses. And they, and they, they said they are going to continue to issue, issue licenses above the market market demand. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a run, runaway. Uh, it, it's kind of ran, ran away with itself that industry in the sense that what we thought would be regulated is not. And um, the county, unfortunately, if we implemented tomorrow a regulation where we said put all these regulations in, all those current people that are doing it are still grandfathered in. And 
So therefore, it, it's not a means of stopping it. Um, those people that have are, will be grandfathered in. Only um, grandfathered in if they have followed the law and followed the rules. I, I understand. Oh, I understand. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of. I'm, I'm simplifying a very complex. Okay. You know. So. You know, uh, we're, not against, uh, uh, we're not against. We're not against growing hemp. We're not against growing hemp. We're, we're against growing hemp next to a school that they don't know it's hemp or marijuana. Yeah. Period. That's that's what I'm against. Or next to a community, yeah, or right. in Canby where they have said. No, we don't want marijuana in here. So all of a sudden, this hemp grove turns into marijuana. Then it's against their city rules. Yeah. So, so our our annual conference is uh, what next week or the week after? It's, uh, it's in the first second week, second week, week of November. Week, yeah. So uh, we'll have an opportunity to raise this then, and we'll see what uh, other counties um, are then, saying as then well. Then the state, it sounds like the, to me that the hemp growers wrote the regulations for the uh, hemp. The, the it, old, it says uh, in in uh, ORS 571-315 that they may not refuse a hemp license to a person if it's against federal law. It says that right in the state rules. It says says even if it's against federal laws, they can they can't even take their license away. So the Oregon uh, the um, Oregon Liquor Control Commission uh -huh. is is a board. And they take public testimony. Uh -huh. I would encourage you to go talk to them. We did. We we did. We, we call the we no no the no Oregon. under public comment just like we just like you are the here Oregon today. Liquor commission, and they said that we don't control anything that is not illegal. They only control the things that are uh, that are permitted. Yeah, they, they write the they, said. they write the go rules. Go to your county. They That's write the rules. I would encourage you under public comment to do the same thing you're doing today and do it yeah. under to their board. Yeah. But the Oregon Liquor Commission says there's another thing. Go to your county. Yeah, well, yeah. they, you know, they wrote the rules that we, I'll tell you what, I, when I was mayor of Milwaukee, we refused a liquor license to somebody who sold y liquor to kids. What did the OLCC do? They gave them a liquor license. Yeah, yeah. see. You tell me how to okay. work with them and I'll do that. But Okay. I do, I do, I do have a couple of state legislatures working on this too, on, on the other end, but... Uh, but uh, the, the uh, Republicans d blame it on the Democrats. Yeah, sure. Really. <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, we will talk about that as a policy, uh, one of our policies okay. to clarify that rules, those rules. Uh, wish us luck. Uh, first, Sonia, and then Martha, and then Ken. Yeah, just a question. You had talked about you being concerned that the grow is near a school. I'm just curious, what are the, you sort of call them secondary effects, what happens, what is the outcome of it being near the school, what are you seeing, what are the concerns, what are the behaviors, the actions, the effects that are happening out of the, was supposed to be a hemp grow that has too much THC is not licensed. What, well, I what, see what are you that, seeing? that uh, people are getting into these hemp grows and uh, stealing the plants, you know, whether it's it's high in THC or low in THC. Okay, so you're seeing crime oh, yeah, increase because oh, yeah, yeah. It, because people you know, are stealing you got the plants. A, you got a five foot marijuana plant okay. growing out in the middle of middle of nowhere. You know what is it? Oh, <laughs> it looks it, it looks exactly like a marijuana plant. Exact. Well, it is a marijuana plant. Okay, so that's the concern is that. People that shouldn't be there are there stealing the plants. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's, and that's, also and you don't also want that type of behavior if, near a school. Excuse me. Yeah, uh, also if it's growing next to a school, and let's say, like our, the growing site next to us, let's say it's high in THC. What happens then Who's if coming? you got if you got school kids coming by? You got you can be growing right in the middle of Camby. You're right, right next okay, to so a, a. Is your concern that the school kids are going to take the plants? I oh, yeah, I get into it. Oh, <laughs> darn right. You know, high school kids, uh, grade school kids. Yeah, they see a marijuana plant. You bet they're going to get into or it. The felons. Who and the felons it draws, at two too. In the morning, they're going to come by and rip off the plants. Mm -hmm. And Greg and Marty have uh, concealed weapons permits. Mm -hmm. Just incidentally, they, they put up an automatic gate and left the neighbors wide open. Yeah, we don't no want a, we don't want a war over plants. Mm -hmm. 
but plants that are illegally grown should be yeah, but enforced by the law. Something's oh, got totally to happen. Oh, I totally agree, but you know, we're not going to go out and test everybody's crops to no, see if they are. No, it has been tested. No, no, this is your issue, not the 150 others that are probably doing the mm -hmm. same thing, yeah. saying they're a, I don't know how many licenses there are for hemp. Probably a, a lot. Bazillion. Yeah. yeah, there, there yeah. there's more, and and a lot of the people that are that are starting to grow it are out of state now too. Of course they are. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, at yeah. Least, and there there are people land. that come out to the city and they had they have these five acres and they're city people. They're not farmers. They come out there and they're city people and they don't have any respect for their neighbors. Yeah. As, as shown by the people that are next door to us, they flip us off. They. They call my, my other neighbor names. They put up a big marijuana sign on the fence. You know, they're, 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 they're not farmers. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Commissioner Schrader. So, I guess here's my, I was going to make a suggestion. I know you suggested to these folks that they go ahead and testify in front uh, and make this complaint. What about what about us codifying this? I mean, we have all the record of all the issues we're facing. Have we ever thought as a body to go in front of them and point out that these are serious issues as a commission? I think, and I and I think AOC needs to move into that mo mode too with Rob Bovet because we have people coming to us. What we can do, we really need to be doing the pushback with the OLCC, mm -hmm. not just our citizens. I say we take these complaints in front of them and say you are really making it so difficult for us to govern uh, in our county and to provide safety and security for our systems because of these issues. Yeah. And don't point the finger at us. We didn't pass it. We didn't want it. Yeah. I know what it's like to be next to marijuana. I had There was an illegal marijuana grow years ago in between a slough on our farm. It wasn't <laughs> on our farm property, but it was right down by the Malala River, by the Willamette River, where the confluence was. Yeah. And I know what it's like to have kids, because my kids didn't know about it. And boy, were they sure interested in wandering around, because oh, yeah. this was new and novel. You mm -hmm. know, and thank God the sheriff had come in, and they'd you know, they saw it visually. Yeah. So I know, I've, I've kind of dealt with that even before it was legal, that this is a huge issue. So I really suggest that we ought to make it one of our um, conversations. I don't know if we bring it up under issues. I don't know if we do a work session, but just listing all these problems and then deciding what we're gonna do to write a letter and move with them directly. So you folks know that you have your county behind you on this. Is so, that a good I idea? Mean, I, mean, I, support, yeah. I support that. Yeah, I, 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 I do too. I that. The problem is idea. you'll know the OLCC would say we don't regulate hemp. You go to the, f you go to the agriculture, oh, we don't regulate but, but hemp. See, no, we don't regulate hemp. Well, well, how are you going to know? Well, it? it's, it's the legislature that did it to us, so we don't regulate but, hemp. It's just, a, just like the opioid thing on the legislature and the U.S. government. You know, the legislature plant passes stuff that deregulates this stuff, and they, they the Oregon State Legislature passed uh, to de deregulate hemp, and, and it ties the Department of Agriculture's hands so they can't regulate hemp, and they wanted to. The, the yeah. Agriculture Department wanted, had a big, long list of stuff that they wanted to regulate. They didn't want it next to schools. They didn't want kids under age uh, 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 working in the fields. They, you know, they had a long list of stuff. And the Department of Justice says, "No, you can't do that." Yeah. So that's where the pushback has to come from, from us, because we're the local governments that exactly. hear this consistently. Exactly. Exactly. And we want we got to push them to make the rules to. Yeah, thank you. you know, Martha. saying, "Well, this isn't working. Yeah. It isn't an easy way to do it. Don't point the finger and say, so who regulates it?" And I want that question answered because I'm sick and you know how I am so sick and tired of this issue and how it has. <laughs> Even how if it they. Has, impacted our rural areas. I mean, yeah. quality of life impacts yeah. tremendous. Even if they do have regulations on it, they're going to uh, reward them with another permit next year. Yep. Yeah. Can, uh, Ken. Ken. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's what we 
I agree with Martha that uh, especially when we go to AOC, we ought to be able to, uh, we should be pursuing this. Um, this is not the only area that we have difficulty in terms of enforcement because people want to do extracts, which have apparently have some additional value, but to do extracts requires uh, the use of certain uh, t potentially explosive gases, and yet we can't regulate the mechanics of all of that. Right. At this point in time, yeah, they, they do. And, that, and that creates another problem, a safety problem, obviously. So I'm more than willing to pursue that as part of this. But I do want to cut to the chase a little bit here. Um, the individual got a permit from OLCV to grow hemp. No. The testing no. says no. they are not no. from uh, agriculture. Ag agriculture. Agriculture department, fine, uh, to grow hemp, not marijuana, and the testing shows that they're growing marijuana, not hemp, which is right. the exactly. same family, and I get that. What I'd like to know from our attorneys, and it may take a little research to do this, if an organization has the authority to grant a permit to do whatever the activity may be, mm -hmm. don't they also have the responsibility of enforcement? I'd like to know if there is a, a legal nexus that would allow that. And then the, the other thing that we should be pursuing is that either agriculture and OLCV do enforcement or they give us the authority to do it. But oh. somebody has to have the, the, um, uh, the legislative authority to actually enforce these rules. Thank and you. stop playing this game of floating money, it around the in the Netherlands. The, resor the resources to do it. I'm all about the enforcement. But they better start coughing up the, the bucks to I, do that. I don't disagree. I'm just saying... <clears throat> They've imposed, they have uh, allowed a right, but with rights come responsibilities, and yet nobody seems to want to take the responsibility. And I, I'm not necessarily concerned whether it's us or them, but somebody should have the legal authority to enforce the rules. And if it's us, then we'll pursue the money to get to hire the people to do it. But the point is, is that uh, right now you have the state allowing certain things to occur. Someone is violating the rules that they agreed to follow when they got their permit, and now everybody goes, but we can't enforce it. And I think that's baloney. You're right. So I, they, would, I would like to know uh, what, we need to what legal on, avenues so we might on. have. Yeah. Well, I suggest it's more people like to testify, okay. yeah. so. Thank you for uh, coming. We've heard you. Yep, thank you Boy, for I, listening I, to us, and uh, thank you for your, your thank support. You so I agree. Thank you. Yep, well, we're heading down to AOC very soon. Yep. And we will, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your lots of counties are having the same problem. Oh yeah, I've talked to to a lot of people from different counties, and they're it's coming at them. So yeah, our our tax revenue received and in the bank so far is fifty six thousand dollars. Right. Correct. Spend yeah, it on this, it. please. That's a drop <laughs> in the bucket. Yeah. yeah. We, maybe the county should grow marijuana. <laughs> well, we call, we call, you don't want to be quoted as saying that. Who's, keep, who's keeping track of it? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Apparently they aren't. Yeah. <coughs> no, and our neighbor doesn't pay tax. I know somebody who paid a quarter million in marijuana sales tax in Clackamas County last quarter. He got $56,000. <laughs> we can't that, hire. That hardly covers the police. Employee. Hardly covers the gas. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, next up we have Everett Hall and um, Kevin Johnson. Thank you for coming. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself and where are you from? We know. Kevin Johnson, Gladstone. <clears throat> I'm here with some comments and questions about the new library deal. For the last seven years, you've not cared what I've had to say about this issue, but I'm going to say it anyway. In the meeting two weeks ago, I heard the only way this new deal could have happened is because new people were elected at the county and the city of Gladstone. That's simply not true. If the county was going to change the may, may, main reason for 3-10, getting the county out of the library operating business, the three of you who have been here for years could have done that long ago. 3-310 also said the citizens of Gladstone would build a new library 
for the 39,000 people of unincorporated Oak Lodge. That part of 3-310 started the fight. If the library results in Gladstone would have settled for a 6,000 square foot library at the beginning, it would have been built long before both sides spent thousands of hours and dollars in a bitter fight. But they wouldn't or couldn't, partly because of 3-310. Along came a group of un-Americans, as Martha liked to call us, that stopped that plan. A new plan resulted from the fight. The plan was voted on after approval to do so by USAME 3. The measure passed. After four years, the new library was on its way. Then more Oak Lodgeons finally realized their library was going to close, and it happened to be an election year. Naturally, with three times more voters in Oak Lodge and Gladstone, the county decided to send Gladstone a notice to terminate the IGA for the new library. <clears throat> Once again, you three could have allowed the library to proceed. One of the reasons given for the termination was Gladstone was going to use library district funds to construct a new library, just as other cities and the county had already done and continue to do. In fact, this new deal pays for two new libraries with library district revenue. How is that possible? The taxpayers in the cities that voted for a bond for library pro projects would probably like a do-over. Then there's Martha's insistence on cities using general fund money for library operations, whether they need it or not. Five cities don't use general fund money for operations, but the new plan requires Gladstone to give the county $200,000 per year out of their general fund for library operations. That works out to $16 per person from Gladstone. Using the same formula, $624,000 per year needs to be paid out of the Oak Lodge general fund to the county. Oh, that's right, their general fund is county money. So which county department will that 624,000 come from? Martha says 3-310 was an elegant plan to give all county residents library service. Then she tried to explain how Sandy was the model for this new deal. As usual, she shows her lack of knowledge. There is very little in common with the situation in Sandy in this plan. The two libraries in the Sandy district were existing. She says the city of Sandy is much larger than the rest of the area the two libraries serve. Wrong. In fact, the unincorporated residents outnumber the cities by almost two to one. If Sandy is the model for the new plan, why are the sizes of the new libraries reversed? And why is the county to, going to continue operating them? Happy Valley should have held out longer so they could have kept running the library county taxpayers built them. Paul was right about one thing. 3 days 310 placed a huge burden on the taxpayers of Gladstone to build the originally planned library. However, he was wrong about unincorporated citizens paying, paying more than their share for operations. The same 39 cents per thousand is paid by all, whether they live in a city or not. All patrons pay the same. That is, unless the city uses general fund. Then once again, city dwellers pay more. Ken says government shouldn't sue each other if the elected officials haven't sat down and tried to reach an agreement. If the county had told Gladstone all the rules could change, the mediation they did have might have gone much differently. It's sad but not surprising. Jim reached out to Oak Lodge residents for information but not Gladstone residents. Again, three to one voters. You can have ceremonies, give speeches, pat yourselves on the back, but as usual, the rules and voter approved measures change when it suits the county. This deal is so different from 3-310, it should go back to the voters. So Jim, build public, public trust through good government. This new library ch plan didn't change my opinion of Clackamas County, not even a little. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I'd just like to make a comment. I don't, I don't wanna, um, I appreciate Mr. Johnson coming and speaking. I, I don't wanna challenge him um, uh, and I know this is a very complex subject and there's no easy way within three minutes to actually give it the accuracy and justice that you probably want to give it and that I would like to give it as well. Um, but 3-310, which is a public record, um, does not say a lot of those things that, you know, it, it's actually, when I, as I read it, when I voted for it back in 2008 or seven, whenever it was, um, it told us the operations maintenance would preserve those libraries, not close them and not make Gladstone build a 39,000 square foot library. I do agree, and I think we both agree, that um, 
as an outcome of 3-310, not in the language, as an outcome, um, it, it resulted in the burden of Gladstone trying to build a library for 39,000 people or whatever the number was, and that was an un unfair burden, and I totally, you and I probably totally agree on that, and, and I think that's true. Uh, the way the arrangement is today, or the settlement is, is that um, of the savings of Oak Lodge, $823,000 of that money in a model, a concept, not, in, not firm, would be transferred to build the library, the capital cost of the Library of Gladstone. So when you do the math, I think there's a few ways of calculating that into that. And I haven't done the per capita benefit of that. But uh, in the end, I think that um, we'll see how it pencils out because there are a lot of concepts in there, there are a lot of adjustments, and we, we're waiting to see what the communities come up with. So I think it's too soon to judge, but uh, granted, um, when the Library District Advisory Committee met here the other night, they had concerns about what the intent of 3-310 was as well. So I appreciate your comments. I'm happy to sit down and go over some of the details as I, as I see it and as I read the agreement that maybe, and maybe you have some ideas as well that you read in there that I haven't factored in, but I'd like to share those ideas. Okay, thanks. Everett? Hello there. Hello. Uh, I'm here to ask some questions about taxes. I was uh, blessed to get my tax bill in the mail, and uh, I thought I would review a little bit about what I saw in the tax bill and, uh, it, and see if there's something we can do. And to itemize that, I'm just going to round the numbers up, okay? Now, I live in a two-bedroom, or excuse me, a three-bedroom, two-bath, two-car garage house, 80 by 100 lot. It's a little bit larger than normal, but nothing really fancy, okay? I just live in, in a plain house. The average citizen in Clackamas County makes, what, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, and uh, this just seems like a bit much. So anyhow, we have the Clackamas Community College, $136. This is just me. The EDS Clackamas Education Service District, $90. The School of uh, North Clackamas, $1,176 for a total of $1,400, okay? Now this represents for the average person three weeks wages take home just on these items here. Then we've got Clackamas County, which I understand that. The county extension of 4-H, $12. Well, Clackamas County was $724. County law enforcement, which I don't understand why that doesn't come out of county budget. That's an enhanced law enforcement district. That right, yeah, $173. <coughs> county library, uh, $97. County public safety, uh, $61. County soils, $12. Fire district one, Clackamas, $583, which again, I think, you know, ordinarily that would come out of the county budget. Park, parks for the Clackamas, $130. Port of Portland, $17. County service lighting, uh, $70. Metro, $23. Metro 2, $23. Urban Renewal County, $44. Vector control, a dollar. Vector control, again, $6. And general government, so for general government, it comes to $1,980. Then we have uh, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, Community College uh, Clackamas Board, $45. County Public Safety uh, for the radio system, $24. Fire District 1, a second one there, $26. School of uh, the North Clackamas Bond, $575. Metro Bond, $53. For a total of, of those, it would be $724. A grand total of $4,100, which for the average person represents more than 10% of their income or three months labor just on county expenses. Now, I have a couple of questions. First off, is there an expiration date on any of these bonds? So the citizens voted those in, those aren't county dollars, and yes, most bonds have an, an expiration period, yes. Okay, then we have gas taxes, state taxes, federal taxes, regulations, fines, and you know, this is getting to be a bit much. And I, need, I just felt like somebody needed to speak up sometime and I was it. 
I don't blame you. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, I just want to say uh, uh, all those things you read off, or most every one of those things you read off, were voter approved. Oh, I understand that. Yeah, yeah but I just want to know if there's an expiration date. Yes. Is there something we can do about it? And can we can we stop putting stuff on the ballot, you know, and try to get the spending under control? Yeah. Government's what, what, first responsibility is to protect the citizens, not to run our lives. Yeah. What I would do is that uh, most of those agencies you listed there have boards that were elected by the folks. Mm -hmm. So if you want, um, what the, we cannot prevent the fire district, for example, or the school district, or any any jurisdiction from putting something before the voters. So um, that, that's something that you can talk to them about. Um, a lot of bureaucracy there. Well, there's bureaucracy. Well, you could say that, yes. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for listening to my trivial complaint. And but, can I just make one comment? Sure. So with your tax bill, you know, our tax assessor, Bob Broman, has, there's a window where people can appeal, appeal their taxes. So there is a methodology. That oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But, you know, for the average person, they don't know that. And, you know, I don't do that, but or I haven't done it so far. So, but anyhow, I felt like, I would just felt like I needed something to say something. You know, I mean, because this is, when it comes to food, shelter, clothing combined, or taxes, it costs me more in taxes than anything else. It's painful. All right, thank you. All right, Don? Yeah, I was just, uh, I, I just did a quick run on the number. Um, so, um, the current median income in Clackamas County, uh, this was based on 2015 numbers, is just about 66,000 currently. Now that's not the same as the average, that's the median income, which is 50% of the population earns more than that and 50% of the population earns less than that. So just a helpful number to kind of work on and yeah. think about. With all but we're talking about population numbers and income, because there's some people out there that make, you know, you know, thirty, forty million dollars a year. I mean, I'm not going to deny them that, but you know, when you take it, take and add it all together, then it's, I, I would say forty thousand is pretty close to the number. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. I don't disagree. You know, at some point the voters need to say that's enough. But Thank it's you. a tough one. Uh, okay. Next, uh, Brainerd Bauer, Brewer, Brower. Yes. Good morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Brainerd Brower. Uh, um, Oregon City is at 18876 South Lyons Road, Oregon City, Oregon, to my address. Um, yeah, I'm coming in front of you again. Just, it's hard for me to make time. It's such an important topic. It has to do, so I'm just, I kind of have a summary there. I'll hit a couple points on it and um, trying to find a way to at least continue the dialogue. Um, so, in regards to the Redland Speed Zone, and the, the proposal to make a 35 mile an hour zone in the commercial zone. And w as you all know, what draw, drew my attention so strongly to this topic was the death last winter, the almost death, um, and now we're heading into the gray, darker season of the winter. Um, and by heading into that season, we're liable to have, unfortunately, more. You know, so. Um, so I wanted to say a couple things. Um, first, uh, I do have to thank Commissioner Bernard because it's his help that at least got us to the point we are. And that is, for the first time in 43 years, it is in front of ODOT, the idea of going down in the speed. The 35 mile an hour zone is, was proposed by battalion chief from the county who lives in the area, knows the, knows the community. It's, it's people who know the community who have been there that understand the common sense of this. Um, but it's in front of ODOT. They're doing their own study. Um, I don't know the status of that. Um, the county did their speed study. Um, and so a couple, couple points to make. Um, we did have an accident uh, caught three weeks ago again. It was similar, but a little different. But the similarity is is somebody pulled in front of a westbound vehicle. All three cases, they were black vehicles. It's kind of an interesting point, and I've kind of been observing. You know, it seems to me that more black vehicles than others don't have their lights on, but obviously, and, and in all these cases, people just didn't see them. You know, and that's where speed comes to play with so many things to look at in a, in a denser commercial area. And we're only asking for this zone in a one-third of a mile, so. 
I would like to encourage, that's one of my points, additional dialogue with any of you, if there's a way to facilitate a broader discussion. You know, I'm looking at other things in the area to improve safety long term as a, as a commercial property owner, but speed is clearly. I did manage to get the battalion chief and the person at ODOT who's the regional decider um, to at least have dialogue. I don't know what that dialogue resulted in, but at least, you know, it's directly somebody who knows, you know, who's credible involved. Um, uh, I know Clackamas County has hired a, or, or a private professional traffic engineering to look at the topic. I don't know the results of that either. Um, and there's a few points here. You can read through it if you're interested. And uh, at the end, you know, I really have to, I mean, I have to beg you to, to help in any way you can. I mean, I, um, and it's the I'll idea of um, meaningful, positive, meaningful solutions, so common yeah. sense. Next tra traffic safety committee that I go to, I'll see what the status is and try to get back to you on that. Thank you. Okay, can, Ken? Uh, can we ask the sheriff to uh, put a deputy out there on a, on a, a at least a, an occasional basis and start writing some tickets. They do it on Leland Avenue for the people that think that going to the golf course is more important than following the speed limit, which is yeah. where I live. You're welcome to reach out. Okay. The, 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 the challenge is for law enforcement, I mean, I, I, I am disappointed in law enforcement for the lack of outreach and dialogue in this process. I, I don't think they've been involved in it that I can tell at all, but the speed limit is it's 45 and it's posted boldly there, and if somebody drives over 55, you know, law enforcement can have an effect. But other than that, I mean, like the, th the two, the fatality, the almost fatality in this recent accident that otherwise would have been much more serious. This last accident was a 3,000-pound vehicle. The two that were fatalities and almost, those were 8,000-plus-pound pickup trucks, you know. Um, they're driving legally. They're just cruising along. I mean, maybe they should be more proactive and they see somebody who might and slow down rather than thinking, hey, get out of my way before I get there, but it's legal. It doesn't even show up as being an illegal activity. You know, it's just somebody doesn't see them as black, I don't know what, you know, and there's a lot of things to look at in it, you know, and. So when the speed is decreased, the sheriff might be helpful. Oh, that's sure a different story. follow the rules. Yeah, absolutely, and, and there's, a, there's a number of people in the rural area that, I mean, they openly say, hey, it's country, we can drive whatever speed we want, pretty much, and it's kind of true. But, I mean, that attitude from those few, it's like, God. You yeah, know. Ken and I have been driving that intersection quite a bit lately. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Martha? Yeah, and I just drove it myself, and I'm well aware of the, yeah. the issue there. And um, it's because you've got this pocket of a rural center yeah. that is not really urban, but it's, you know, got that center, yeah. and, and it's in a rural, it's in a rural area, and it's a real problem. And um, I felt it was, I mean, my assessment was just from my own driving. I had I was extra careful because I was aware of yeah. how bad that corner is, and, and it's it's a blind corner essentially. So, what well, gets you, well, fortunately what gets you there the is, is fortunately there is pretty good sight distance, and I mean I have to compliment. I mean, for example, things that have been done this year, I do compliment the uh, um, uh, maintenance bureau from the county for the work they've done on shoulder maintenance. Yeah, That's been silly. tremendous this year. Such an improvement. You know, and, and the serious accidents we've had are attributable to that, you know, along the road, you know. Um, but fortunately, our visibility, the county, the maintenance has done a little bit to help with visibility on one of my properties, too, to kind of get everything we can do. You know, you know, visibility can play a role in this, but it's mostly too many things to pay attention to in speed. All right. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll find out. All okay. Right. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda. Ask the clerk to read the consent agenda by title. Okay, today's consent agenda. Under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of an intergovernmental revenue agreement with the Oregon Department of Education Early Learning Division for Preschool Promise Capacity Building, approval of an agency services contract with Cascadia Behavioral Health Care to provide peer support services, Approval of an agency service contract with LifeWorks Northwest for outpatient substance abuse for uninsured and indigent Clackamas County residents. 
approval of an agency services contract with Cascadia Behavior Healthcare for supported employment services, approval of amendment number one to an intergovernmental agreement with Multnomah County for the reduction of opioid, opioid overdose and death program, approval of amendment number two to the intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oregon acting by and through its Oregon Health Authority for operation as a local public health authority for Clackamas County <coughs> under elected officials, approval of a intergovernmental grant agreement for the child abuse multidisciplinary intervention program for the district attorney's office and approval of a contract with Mark 43 for public safety records management solution for the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Under public and government affairs, approval of a board order for an extension of the cable television <coughs> franchise with Canby Telephone Association doing business as Canby Telecom. Under technology services, approval to enter into a service level agreement between Clackamas County, Clackamas Broadband broadband exchange and Merrill Hearst University for dark fiber connection and business and community services approval of a contract with CXT for the purchase of a precast concrete restroom at Friar Park. That concludes today's consent agenda. Does any member wish to remove a polling item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, we're on to county administrator updates. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, once again, I've got a uh, really nice uh, communication regarding the customer service work of our staff in transportation and development. Uh, this involves a county resident. Uh, expressing his appreciation for uh, service uh, from our plumbing inspector, Sam Hombo. Uh, resident Ray F. was uh, installing a water line and a water heater on his own. He ran into some problems along the way, and uh, luckily Sam uh, was able to help him through the problems and reach uh, a code-compliant installation there. Uh, Ray said that Sam was fair, knowledgeable, friendly, and gave 150%. So I just wanted to say great job, uh, Sam, for helping out one of our residents be able to complete uh, their project successfully and have a positive experience with Clackamas County. Uh, then at a recent conference, uh, it's, it was the Pacific Northwest Clean Water Association uh, conference, uh, our Water Environment Services Capital Program Manager, Lynn Chicoyne, was honored for her outstanding service as a delegate for both uh, the association and the uh, Water Environment Federation. The association represents clean water agencies in the Northwest, and the federation is dedicated to protecting public health and the environment through water quality. And I want to express a congratulations to Lynn for that. I think this recognition really nicely illustrates the professional level of staff we have here uh, working at the county, and particularly over at West. Uh, then uh, our energy assistance program staff in health, housing, and human services have received some good news. Uh, that program, which is committed to ensuring that low-income residents are able to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer, uh, we learned that the program distributed uh, some 3.4 million that helped more than 12,000 county residents. And thanks to that work, uh, we earned a superior rating uh, during our recent program compliance review by the state of Oregon. So this rating is given to programs that uh, perform above the standards in the areas of applications and payments. And I just want to say, keep it up to our energy assistance folks. Uh, then the last item I have for you is something that um, our assistant uh, county administrator, Dan Chandler, uh, was able to bring home with him, I call it bring home the bacon, um, the International City County Management Association has issued to Clackamas County a Certificate of Achievement, and this is in uh, recognition of our use of performance data in local government management, including training verification and uh, public reporting. This was presented at the 103rd ICMA uh, Annual Conference in uh, San Antonio 
uh, Texas. So I want to express a uh, special appreciation for the work that Dan's been doing leading this effort uh, across all the county offices and departments. Uh, and also want to thank all the county departments and offices that have been participating in our managing for results efforts uh, to help us achieve this. It's really just uh, from my standpoint, the beginning of what is a long-term investment in uh, performance management here at the county. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. First up is Commissioner Humbertston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I was thinking about making an ESL comment, but I think I'll just uh, leave it at that. <laughs> or maybe that was it. Um, <clears throat> recently attended the diversity conference uh, with other commissioners uh, in Portland, which was uh, both interesting and challenging. Um, also went to the Schellenberg Institute here in Clackamas County and had some demonstrations of some of the high-tech kinds of things that uh, the young people are doing in that school. Uh, and being prepared for high-tech jobs uh, in the entertainment industry in particular, and from every level, from the acting level all the way through production, um, lighting, equipment operation, all of it. Very, very uh, interesting tour. Um, uh, Commissioner Savas and I met with the Concord Partnership to discuss the library issues um, in, uh, at the Concord School, and they've kind of assured us that you know, they're open to this whole community process and look forward to participating in it and they're not locked into their current to some of the information they've gathered up to this point as I recognize there's been some changes in, in what the options may be so uh, that bodes well moving forward for our library project um, <clears throat> we all went to lunch in Estacada at the Chamber of Commerce and heard from the Estacada community on some of the issues that were important to them and I had a, a meeting with uh, Shirley Craddock, uh, who is uh, running for re-election at the Metro Council, and sort of in the mode of, of you know, what can they do for us, how, and how can we um, rebuild our relationship with them. Uh, and it was a very positive um, uh, interchange. And finally, I have a meeting coming up with a uh, BARC representative where I expect to be bringing up the issue of, guess what, cross-laminated timber, and hopefully we can... Um, get them on board with our project as we move forward. I also know that I believe on Monday we will be going back up to the uh, uh, Matrix Lands to meet with the Forest Service representative and discuss uh, how we go forward with the project uh, on those lands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doug. Oh, Doug, yes, thank you. Oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm still working on the uh, Fair Board Agreement, and we had a um, candid conversation with the leadership of the Fair Board this morning. Um, so hopefully this will get done mm -hmm. soon. This is Rupert, and he's a handsome fellow with a plenty of potential. Yes, he's a big boy with a big wagging tail and a big happy grin to match. He's still a youngster, even though he is most likely full grown. There's plenty for him to learn, and taking training classes would be an ideal way for him to study and bond with you. He needs a home with no kitty cats and children over nine. That's probably because he could knock them down. His perfect home will not have small dogs because sometimes he does not know his own strength and he could easily overwhelm a small dog. Plenty of exercise, daily walks, and active games will help round out his education. Just think of the good times you can share with him. Come and meet him today. For more information about Rupert and other adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503-655-8628 or www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Yeah, <clears throat> well, it's been a long week. Um, <clears throat> Sunday I attended um, uh, a thing called Isocarp, and it was a, um, invited by some of the members um, there to attend. Um, they're looking at studying uh, both Milwaukee Industrial Area, McLaughlin Boulevard in the unincorporated area, and Oregon City's Willamette Falls site. Um, very interesting to get some out of country uh, young planners for, that are out of our country with their experiences and knowledge base, and then sharing some ideas. It was actually very, very stimulating and engaging. I really had a, I really had a great time, and I actually just came there to watch. And they kept on pulling me back into the dialogue. So, no, not you. <laughs> and so, what was that saying? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. So they were. It was. It was actually a lot of fun, uh, and. Uh, as Commissioner Humberson stated, we are at our diversity conference on Monday, and 
uh, went to the library advisory committee and our administrator spoke to the group because we had a lot of feedback on libraries. We heard from a gentleman today, heard from a uh, person yesterday, um, several people actually, so it's been very engaging. And also the other thing that has come up out of this um, has been the public process for the future of, and Commissioner Humberson touched on that when he talked about the um, Concord Partnership Group, but there's also constituents and of the Parks District, <clears throat> you know, just people who live in the community, they want to see a public process for the disposition of what happens to that property in and of itself, absent the library thing. Um, so there's all of these um, diverse people with opinions and ideas about how the library and the parks come, come across, and we're going to hear a lot of that as the public process rolls out, but uh, I think how we um, engage or coordinate the public process for the parks, for Concord, and the public process for libraries, because they have two distinct goals and purposes, because parks are parks, and yeah, so we, that's going to be kind of challenging, so we need to talk about that. Uh, last night and the night before was when the Jenny's Lodge community and also the Oak Lodge uh, CPOs and uh, they're looking at what's going to be the public process for the awards that we or the grant awards that we expect this afternoon from Metro. Um, so there's people wanting to get engaged um, that felt that they have not been had an op of course they have not had an opportunity yet. So I'm looking forward to how we draft or craft that RFP and that public process for that as well. So there are a lot of things and a lot of energies and synergies there that are, that are all coalescing in the same geographic area of the county. So it's been, uh, it's been a long week, but uh, very productive. This morning I was at the uh, Transit Improvement Group. It's a new committee formed uh, as a result of the legislator, legislative bill uh, 2017. Uh, came out of the legislature um, earlier this year. Uh, and this specific committee is um, mandated in, in the legislative language to be committed to actually how they're going to distribute and um, uh, set the rules and so forth for the new transit dollars around the state that are, and specifically in our region, um, uh, this is going to be Clackamas County, Washington County, and Multnomah County, and how those dollars are distributed and, and how they're spent and the plans and the rules that go with that. Clackamas County has uh, four other, five actually, transit agencies or delivery mechanisms aside from TriMet, and how they overlap and serve one another was also part of the dialogue. So it's been, a, and that's part of the reason I was a little bit late. Um, that meeting ended at 9.45, so. Um, in Portland. In Portland, in oh, Portland. Man. So uh, the, the traffic lights were in my favor, um, so. Must have been. Yeah, so must have been. I thought that's why that officer was staying outside the door there. No, I actually don't know. I'm not sweating that because I know I didn't break the speed limit. But fortunately, all the lights, you know, by the way, at 10 o'clock in the morning, it's a lot less traffic than at 7 or 8, oh, 8 yes, o'clock, I'll yes. tell you that. And the key is is not to take I-205. Yes, I know. Okay. The key yeah. is to take the surface roads. That's how I got here. And, but that's what I have. Great. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, a couple of things that have been on, on my mind. I was able to participate in the sheriff's domestic violence sweep last week, and that wow. is a pretty incredible day where law enforcement goes out and executes outstanding warrants in domestic violence cases. The room, what was so dramatic for me personally was being there with all law enforcement and the room was full. We've all been to that room at the public safety um, center there on Sunnyside. It's a very large room. It was full of officers ready to go out and do that work. Very, very important work because when victims know that there will be accountability, they are more willing to come forward and that's just so very important. All of us also participated in the housing policy session yesterday. And a couple things that have really been resonating with me, which I felt really strongly about and that came out really clearly is number one, we need to look at doing things differently. We need to look at mixed income housing so that we have economic diversity because right now in this crisis that we're in, we do have an opportunity out of these difficulties to look towards building a better community, which is very, very important. And the other piece that we really need to be aware of, which I thought was very well stated, 
is that our demographics are changing. Our, we have many more people who are aging and we need to be thinking about our aging population and we need housing that they can afford. So those are a couple things that have been on my mind. I really appreciate my fellow commissioners sharing these passions and concerns with me because it's with all of us working on these important issues that we'll be able to make progress. Great. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Schrader. It yeah, um, was a busy week. Um, we've all been really busy this week. I think the key thing that, um, that, that happened for me was we had a meeting with Margaret Salazar, who is the director of the Oregon Housing and Community Services with the Association of Oregon Counties and the League of Oregon Cities at the table. Uh, Greg Wolf and the executive director of the League of Oregon Cities. And what we presented to her was a, was a framework for technical assistance across the state. One of the things our analysis is suggesting from the city's viewpoint and the county uh, perspective is that uh, whereas we have a, a very robust housing infrastructure uh, in Clackamas County, some of our smaller cities and our smaller counties actually need technical assistance. So under the umbrella of LOC and AOC, we are suggesting that uh, OC, the Oregon Housing and Community Services at the state level actually fund, uh, similar to what they did with uh, Lip Sync, which is the public safety process throughout the state of having folks who are really truly dedicated to the there there of the technical assistance it takes. A lot of these folks realize they have a problem. They don't know where to start in the whole uh, world of, of what it takes to really solve the problem, whether it be workforce housing, affordable housing, transitional you know housing, uh, on the ground shelter housing. So she seemed very, very open to the idea. So I, can, I continue to work with, um, uh, the young woman, and I'm going blank on her name, but she is tasked to go throughout the state on behalf of the Oregon, uh, you know, of the community and housing folks uh, to really get the sense of what's happening statewide. And OCA, the Oregon Housing uh, Services, they are actually compiling demographic data. We've already done this at AOC, actually, to an extent. The Association of Oregon Counties has already kind of done a very surface view of this. But they're really going in depth looking at demographics needs money, fundamentally what those regions need. So that was that was really, really good. And the other thing is that when the director of Oregon Housing and Human Serv and, and, and Community Services, Margaret Salivar, says that we have one of the best housing teams uh, in the in the in the state. Uh, that includes, you know, Jill, Chuck Robin, Robbins, all of those folks. She was aware of them, she knew them. Uh, basically Rich Richard Swift, the director, uh, gave me a list of the grants that we are applying for, lift grants and so on and so forth at the state level. And I just said, here you go. And so I handed her the list and she goes, oh, this, 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 and this, okay, you're gonna, so I think we really moved ahead our local opportunity because of their reputation um, to get what we need for our county, but also we're helping to inform a statewide initiative. So very complimentary to our team, and I want to get that on record, and I hope they know that, uh, because uh, I, I believe they are the best, but that's just me. Uh, we did have an elected officials forum at West with, with most of us attending, and uh, I don't know how many times I've toured the sewer plant, but every time I sure love that membrane technology, by golly, that's that's a glorious thing to see, protecting <laughs> public health. And we talked about uh, how we're going to move forward with our cities in terms of governance and coordination with how we do it. Oh, yeah. I lo don't you love membrane systems? I'm like, oh, yes. man, these I things are so about cool. It. Oh, hey, yeah. I do. But yeah. then again, you know, there you go. Um, we did. I did have an update on the Metro Regional Solutions Advisory Committee, from which I serve. Uh, Rahana Antri is the new uh, contact person. Essentially, it's it's really our group that that gets together at the regional level um, to come up with uh, 
you know, solutions for our economic development, our regional priorities. And basically, the priorities include economic development, equity, infrastructure, brownfield re redevelopment, clean energy, and climate resiliency, workforce development, housing. Uh, and basically, under all those umbrellas, we work to come up with uh, regional solutions. And under the, the climate piece, I'm going to build a little bit on what Ken has talked about with cross-laminated timber. Um, she put together a list of folks that we need to keep in the loop with that, everybody from legislators uh, to influence, influencers. We're not ready to move it forward as a regional uh, solutions piece yet until we get our pilot project. So I talked to her about that. We're in the process of really with um, Ken's been working very hard on this and getting a pilot project for cross-laminated timber. Once that happens, we're hopeful that regional solutions can help us frame a statewide policy on how we, how we get our, our timber production up in a sustainable, green, friendly way. Um, trying to think, oh, with, uh, with AOC, given the fact that we talked about marijuana today, I think that, um, I think I'll be talking to Rob Bovet as the second vice president, soon to be the first vice president, eventually president of really maybe working with our counties to get more uh, leverage in front, directly in front of OLCC and those powers that be. Um, and if we want to lead the way with that, that would be great. Um, there's a lot more, but we got to get out of here. Okay, arts and culture activities in the county. <laughs> the art gym, Symmetry Breaking. Symmetry Breaking features eight contemporary visual artists from the Pacific Northwest. The, this exhibition, curated by Blake Shell, showcases the work of artists who engage or interest with craft materials or processes. Thursday through Sunday, October 26, noon to 4, at the art gym on the Merrillhurst University campus. Philip Foster Haunted Farm. Oh, it's Halloween time. You will meet the real people who lived and died here in Eagle Creek at the end of the Oregon Trail. This family-friendly event introduces all ages to the real realities of life in Pioneer, Oregon. October 28th, 6 to 8, at Philip Foster Farm in Eagle Creek. Arts Alliance uh, is at clackmasartsalliance.org. One more thing I'm going to add so I don't forget the uh, MPAC, which is the land use planning. They are now beginning. They've reviewed uh, housing information across our re across the Tri-County region. However, now uh, I think Don and I recently got the, the um, update from, uh, from Metro. They're going to actually start now looking at that kind of mid time expansion of the UGB. So I've called for more staffing on that uh, so we can be up to speed on it. Most of the meetings heretofore have been largely informational, but we're going to be starting now to move into a, a series of time where there's going to be key decisions that are made. So we're going to get the staffing up. I've already talked to planning about it. I've already talked to DTD uh, because now it's the time where we've got to influence that whole process. Okay. So I was somewhat involved in that process. Uh, Clackamas County has one city that is ready, Wilsonville. I don't know that that's a staffing issue. I think we should look at that, but well, the, the rule basically is so much land in the entire metro region. Wilsonville's is a portion, Hillsborough's a portion, a couple other cities will So let me clarify what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Uh, back in the day when I worked with Doug McLean, who was the director of our planning department, remember Mary's nodding her head, she remembers. He would uh, regularly uh, review the information. We'd have regular meetings talking about what was happening and what was going on. And I really want to make sure that that is happening in a much more clear way. We have a staff person who's been attending the technical meetings but we have not had the same level of briefing on the policy piece of it that we had had back in the day. And I think that that particularly needs to happen, where there is one policy person who goes to the impact meetings as well, and is every for every me meeting having regular updates, whether or not you think it's significant or not, that needs to be reinstituted. And it hasn't been as... Uh, institutionalized as I would have liked it. So that's essentially, so it's really not an addition. It's really going back to what um, what was done prior that was much more efficient and much more informative uh, and really made that, made, made that linkage happen a little more thoroughly. 
okay, great. Uh, planning department tour, I toured it yesterday. I haven't been there in a while. It's quite an improvement. I mean, they've really made it feel very inviting. I had an opportunity to talk to Mike. He had five retirements suddenly. And he has three, pe three new people he's looking at, uh, uh, fairly new in the business, and some a little higher up have more experience. Uh, went to the diversity conference, health equity workshop yesterday, which was very good. Uh, Mary Jo and I went, and we split up in the tables, and the guy really made us work. And I really thought it was great. I had not thought of many of the issues that we discussed. Uh, anyway, it was it was great. Um, I did just look up marijuana THC. The average marijuana THC is 18.7 percent, so 0.125 or whatever. Wait, whatever he said it was. 0.67. Yeah, is way below uh, what uh, marijuana does. Uh, so, but you know, in Canada, this issue has been resolved for many years. I mean, hemp, at you, hemp clothing, hemp soap all that stuff, and you can also distill hemp for soap, too, but it's a different. It's, it's a different different strain. It's a different, it's hemp, not marijuana. It's not this. No, I think it is, it's hemp. Uh, well, I think that's that's the issue. It's yeah, the, I know, the, the definition. but I, I was and, gonna and, mention. And the purpose. I, I was gonna mention it, Martha did, and then since she's on the board, uh, that's an advantage, because this is a huge, Problem and my guess is it ain't gonna get better. That's right. With that, nothing else. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>